So, as you probably know, for a few years now, Provenance Analysis has integrated Zircon to, you, uh, to uh, track the eroded sources. And so, indeed, Zircon's, Zircon is an interesting tool um, due to its large uh, occurrence and also to its high resistance to alteration and uh, erosion. So, this is really, really interesting for sediments. Um, moreover, during its growth, Zircon is able to record in its chemistry different information linked to the geological event it undergoes. And so, maybe even more important, we are able to distinguish the different geodynamic uh, events uh, through the um, different growth periods that we see, and also to read those information by in situ measurement, like here. And so those different informations are good parameters about uh, the original rock in which the zircon has been formed, and so we can uh, have access through the chemistry and so from the radiogenic system, from uranium and lead, about the crystallization, crystallization age. But we have also access to degree of contamination by recycled material from the oxygen and lithium isotopes. We have access to the magmatic um, crystal and mantle or mantelic origin. Uh, through the hafnium isotopes, and also from the traces element content, we have access to the crystallization temperature from the titanium, but also from an, uh, an idea of the rock type in which the zircon has been formed from a uh, kind of list of uh, different elements, and even uh, we can have an idea of the oceanic or continental origin of the zircons from uranium, thorium, and yttrium content. Nevertheless, when you have all those parameters, you can't completely constrain the geodynamic settings in which the zircons has been formed. So today, I would like to show you our first results, is still work in progress, I have to admit it, uh, about um, um, our uh, result from the um, project that we have to establish a direct link from, uh, between the zircon chemistry and the geodynamic context of formation. So for this, we have uh, sampled different contexts through magmatic rocks. So I insist it's magmatic zircons today that I'm talking about. And so from those magmatic rocks, we have um, performed some analysis, chemical analysis, to characterize them in terms of chemistry. But we have also, of course, extracted the zircons. On those zircons, we have done some CL cathodoluminescence imaging to uh, reveal the structure, so to know what we were talking about and what we were uh, an analyzing in terms of chemistry from the zircons. And so when necessary, we also perform some, uh, some dating on them to help for the selection of the grains. From those selected grains, we did first uh, major element uh, measurements by electronic microprobe and it also helped us to have an internal standard to help for the conversion of the analysis uh, on the traces element that we perform by laser, um, um, and a laser ablation ICPMS. And so on those traces element, we obtained something like 700 measurements. We applied some filters to be sure that we were avoiding chemistry of the zircons that could have been perturbated by later events. And so today, I will show you, we are approximately at this step here. I mean, not really, we don't have found still yet the method, but I will show you what we are uh, working on, actually. So, uh, we have uh, sampled six different um, geodynamic contexts. The intracontinental one is represented by um, alkaline complexes from the Kamrut volcanic line, as you see here. We have uh, also sampled sink collision and post collisional um, uh, variscan complexes that are mostly calcalkaline uh, in Brittany but also in the Swiss Alps. And in the Swiss Alps, and we have also uh, found some active margin and pre collision uh, settings. And we also completed our database by um, uh, uh, Chenaillet Ophiolite in the French Alps. So in general, we have uh, mostly sampled granites, but we have also tried to have less differentiated gabbros to have uh, a wider crystallization sequences to see if it was involved um, influencing also the chemistry of the zircons. And uh, here is the whole rock chemistry, and you see that about major and traces element, in fact, we have quite a large variation of uh, of potential chemistry of the rocks, of course, but also a potential chemistry of the zircons that we have sampled. But when you're working with uh, zircons, you know that the chemistry is rather monotonous. So, of course, in terms of traces element, um, here 
we have what we were expected from the literature. There was not, not big surprises. And as I said, we have applied some filters to avoid um, perturbated chemistry. So we have worked on the rare earth element uh, thresholds to avoid those alterations on that we could see. We have also um, avoided um, zircons that had a thorium-uranium um, ratio that could indicate that they were metamorphic, in fact. And uh, we have also avoided um, analyses that contain some traces uh, element that could show that we have influenced by micro-inclusion that we couldn't see on, under the microscope. So here I present you what you have already seen uh, just before, the typical traces, um, rare earth element patterns where you have the typical cerium positive anomaly and europium negative anomaly. And as you see here, the rare earth elements are overlapping each other according to the different geodynamical settings. So it's not discriminating like this for uh, what we expect to, to do. I have also tested uh, to see a little bit what kind of traces element could be uh, significant for us. So I have tested the xenotime type substitution, which account that yttrium and rare earth elements are balanced by the phosphorus. So if you have only xenotime type substitution in your zircons to include the rare earth element in it, you should plot only on this one-to-one -one line, which is the case for only really few of our zircons. So I have also tested to see if lithium has, has some um, uh, role to play. So here is the lithium that um, is added to our, uh, our data. And if you have a look, it works for some of our zircons a little bit more than before, but it doesn't account for all of them. And I have also tried to see if nobium uh, and, uh, sorry, not uh, lanthanide, but tantanium is, is, uh, has also an, uh, an influence, as you see. It's uh, explained for maybe a majority of our zircons, but still, I still don't know how uh, exactly some of our zircons are in um, rare earth element excess compared to phosphorus. Maybe it has something to do with also some alteration, but based on our filters, we are supposed to have only magmatic chemistry, uh, primary magmatic chemistry of our zircon. Nevertheless, we have also tested just uh, quickly to see if we have some fractionation during the analysis, because halmium and yttri um, yttrium has different uh, masses, but they behave similarly in our zircons. So it means that we don't have a bias due to our analysis, uh, due to the laser ablation that could help for the fraction mass fractionation. We also have tested the ytterbium and yttrium, and as you see, they are, sim they are behaving similarly also except for few um, grains, and those grains were showing some phosphorus effect, um, uh, excess, before, excuse me, uh, just in the xenotime type substitution. So maybe it has something to do with uh, uh, ytterbium uh, or yttrium um, loss or depletion uh, in our case. So I have also uh, tried to add literature uh, to my uh, data. So those are um, uh, samples that are coming from MORB, so mid-ocean rich basalts, which are supposed to plot in our green uh, group here. So it works for a few of them, but not for all of them. So um, the problem is maybe due to the fact that we are, losing, uh, we are using laser ablation systems, so we uh, ablate a larger volume, we analyze a larger volume that they do because they use sims or shrimp. And so, in a certain way, we are diluting a little bit the variations that we could have. So, um, finally, I couldn't really um, try to add data from the literature due to the difference of uh, analyzing system. But anyway, as you, as you can see on those four plots, uh, we have found some traces element that helps for the discrimination, at least for those five first group. Um, we have not so much difficulties to separate the ocean rift and sometimes from the intracontinental or for the pre-collisional uh, magmatism. But uh, on those four plots, the problem comes uh, mostly from the post-collisional group. And so maybe the problem is more about the definition of what we call a post-collision. In a certain way, the post-collisional magmatism depends on what you have collided and accreted before. So in a certain way, maybe the past collision is something that you mix with uh, intracontinental arc because something has been subjected. And so in a certain way, we have maybe to think 
a little bit more about what we call post-collision post in our samples and to redistribute the data that could be uh, ascribed to something that is more like uh, intracontinental or that was a pre-collisional uh, event. Nevertheless, as you see, it works almost for all, all our data when we consider uh, the more incompatible um, traces element like nobium and rubidium. So my conclusions are more perspective because it's still something that we have to work on. So first we have to continue to test some diagrams to see if we have some uh, relationship between those traces elements. And uh, I have tested uh, um, ternary diagrams, but since then it's almost more a mess than on the uh, binary diagrams. Um, the next step will be to, uh, uh, to do rather principal component analysis to try to delimit the group more in space, like in n dimensions, according to traces element that we are that are really significant. But anyway, it seems possible to separate some context, but we have first to add samples because it will enlarge the potential variability of the zircon chemistry. It will also um, include different crystallization sequences that could also uh, influence the, the zircon uh, chemical content. And we have this problem for the post-collision, so problem of definition or to redistribute the data according to each area we know uh, the geology. And of course, we, had to new, we have to add new context because only six geodynamic contexts are not explaining the whole earth. So thank you very much.